people who are not language scientists still have notions about language, they have ideas and views and beliefs about language. Given that this information exists, why do we also need a scientific approach to language? Let's compare the two. Now, it is true that folk notions of language have value. They provide some accurate information about how language functions. And even when this information is inaccurate or incomplete, it's still valuable to know something about how speakers think about their language. But this everyday perspective on language is limited for several reasons. One is that very often people who are not language scientists take the perspective that language should be a certain way and without awareness that notions such as correct grammar are social constructions. They tend to be just accepted as if they were a, some kind of fact of nature. Meanwhile, language scientists aim to describe as objectively as we can how people actually interact. Another limitation is that the everyday perspective on language tends to ignore interesting distinctions and phenomena. Some things are just not noticed. And this is a necessary result of the fact that of all the information that you have about the language or the languages that you speak, there's only a small part that you actually are aware of and that you therefore would be able to describe and explain to other people. Kind of in the same way as, you know, all day long you breathe, but if you had to explain with precision how that works anatomically, physiologically, unless you've studied it, you would not be able to articulate that. So ignoring some distinctions and phenomena, let's take an example from the area of describing linguistic politeness. There might be a folk notion that please and thank you in English are polite words. How about this example though? Suppose someone says, I love you, and the person responds, thank you. Is that a polite response? Maybe, but right away we have a sense that something more needs to be said about this situation. Basically, describing linguistic politeness has to be more involved than just identifying a set of words or expressions that count as polite. There's more to it than that. So on the scientific side, the aim is to describe all aspects of interaction in a whole range of situations. Finally, one more limitation is that everyday perspectives of language are quite likely to be culture-centric looking at phenomena through the lens of the person's own culture. For example, an American might think, oh, Japanese culture is so much more polite than American culture. But this would be an idea that emerges because the person is looking at Japanese interactions through an American lens. Given American expectations of how much work one should be doing in an interaction, it might seem as though a Japanese person is just doing a lot of extra work. But for the Japanese people involved in the interaction, to them it might be just unremarkable, normal interaction. So people everywhere are concerned with matters of politeness and showing respect. It is shown in different ways in different communities but these notions exist everywhere, and it doesn't really make sense to measure one culture by the standards of another and to say that somehow the sum total of politeness for one group of people is greater than for another. It just doesn't really have meaning to say that. So rather than being culture-centric on the scientific side of describing language, we aim to have descriptions that apply universally, that is, for any speech community, for any culture. So this has been a sampler of why, even if as a speaker of a language, you have already a lot of information and ideas about it, if you're going to be a student of language, you really do need to take the scientific approach and use technical terms and concepts to give full descriptions of linguistic phenomena.